turns out the director of the movie was in town that week. They all went out to this club that we're playing and we didn't suck. Like we had a great time. They had fun. And they're like, man, we should put, we should find a place for you in the film. And Andy, who was the director goes, well, there is the scene. There's the bar scene and the festival scene. We could make a thing for you. And if you guys want to do it. And I'm like, hang on, let me just check my calendar, Andy, real quick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And there we go. We are live with another episode of Open Action with me, John McLean, brought to you by Arms Corps. And this guest that I have, I'm super excited to have a conversation with because my my girlfriend, Kelly, has been ranting and raving about having him on the show. And then I actually did some research and I listened to an audiobook that I downloaded from this gentleman and was blown away. It was a great book and, and I love the way he, he read it. Uh, so I'm just super excited to have Kenny Thomas on for this episode. Kenny, for those that don't know, let's give a, a little bit of a bio. Explain who you are and why you're so cool. That's funny. Who, who am I and why am I so cool? Well, first of all, thanks for downloading the audio book. You're the one. They told me someone had done that, <laughs> and I, I'm pretty excited. It's funny when you listen, when I go back and listen to the audio book, because you can tell what time of day I was reading. So you can tell when I came in in the morning to the studio because I'm all peppy and it's moving. And you can tell when it was like after lunch because I'm dragging throughout the stories. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, so my, I, you know, I know I, I ended up meeting Kelly through Nashville through the music world. So I got out of the military. I was in the Ranger Regiment. Got out. I'm kind of an anomaly. Got out of the military. And then went to Nashville, had a writing, songwriting contract, and then that turned into a record deal. And then that was, got to do that. That was fun. You know, that, that, that always has a shelf life to it, though. So you, uh, and then I went, from there, people started hearing about my military story, which was I was part of the Ranger Regiment, the, the 3rd Battalion that fought in Mogadishu, so the Black Hawk Down story. And because I was on a stage and because this thing that people give you is a responsibility, like, John, if you got up here and they give you a mic and Arms Corps wants you to go do a podcast, at some point you have to have something to say. Like, it's you can't just, you know, we don't need any more fluff. And uh, so it was a responsibility. People started knowing the backstory and it became the way that I always introduce it is, yeah, it's – it's always been when you make it out of something where other people did not, you're going to spend the rest of your life thanking the, the men and women who were on your left and your right that day. Cause I can promise you by the grace of God, they're the only reason I'm still around. So it became a, I was very proud to tell the story. It, 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 but it was a bit of a responsibility because if I, I had that ability to be in a public setting and if I didn't, tell their story than who would and that sort of transition so when I got done with the you never don't the music is a disease that you're never done with but when I got done with that I started transitioning into just I go around the country now and I use that story as a leadership example so how do you how do we all become better servant leaders and take care of each other and when we need you to do that is when it's hard. So I use that story and I'm out on, I'm, so I'm still kind of rock starring it around. It's just a different, I don't have a band behind me. I, I, I stand up there on the stage and I tell a story and then at the end of it, I'll, I'll play a song. But uh, it's, yeah, how I got outside of God, John, I couldn't tell you how I got here. This was not by any kind of plan. <laughs> Nobody wakes up and goes, I think I'm going to be a keynote speaker when I grow up and I'm going to go in the military and then I'm going to go be a, a country artist. Like, I, it doesn't, I don't know how it worked out, but that's how it worked out. Well, and, and what's interesting too, that you even, you even cover in your book was the concept that um, there was a, a time in your life where you weren't kind of sure what to do when you were considering going into contracting. Right. So you came out of the military and you're just kind of in this like transitional phase from I've been a warrior, I've been trained to do a certain job and now I what do I do with all the skills that I've learned? I don't know, so I think I'm going to get into contracting, but you you had, you know, a friend that really had a lot of faith and and belief in you for your talent which was singing, playing guitar, songwriting. And he, he kind of pushed you into, no, like, dude, yeah. 
Yeah. You're good with the contract contracting thing. Like, no, go chase your dream. Be an artist because you've got something that um, he didn't see in other people. Like anyone, like, I mean, I have guitars. I can try and sing. You'll, you'll know when I'm singing because the cats start meowing everywhere uh, around my house. But, um, you know, so, so you had that good, uh, that, that positive person in your life that told you like, no, that, that's not your calling anymore. You've done your duty. You've done your service. Now go go do something that I think would, would benefit the world in a better way. So um, right. it, it's, and it's cool to, to, for you to be able to explain that, that process of like, you're, you're kind of feeling lost. You're not quite sure what to do, but if you, if there is something that, I mean, I always try and explain it. Like, you know, when, when I got into competition shooting, you didn't have to pay me to want to go shoot. Like I wanted yeah. to go to the matches. I wanted to compete. I wanted to talk, talk to hang out and get better. And prog- so like the fact that it turned into something that kind of became a career was because I was doing it for free already, but I had so much passion behind it. And so, right. um, you know, I, I think that's pretty cool that you were able to have a, an influence that told, you no, you're done with the, you're done with the military side. Now go be an artist because there's something special. And then of course you were able to accomplish that. Yeah. It's a, there's a couple points that you made to that story that that you know that makes sense that are kind of fundamental. And one, it's that I'm assuming there'll be a lot of there's a good number of veterans that'll tune into this just because the, the they're they have the same interests and they're thinking alike. But they'll under, you understand when you make that transition out, there is a bit of loss, like where, because you're so. Uh, what you had in the military, whatever your job was, you had a sense of purpose. It, it doesn't. You could have been a pack clerk. You could have been a refueler. You could have been a, 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 a helicopter pilot or a stormtrooper door kicker. You had a purpose, and you knew you had people here to your left and your right, and that they counted on you, and you counted on them. And then you get out, and you don't necessarily have that right away because it takes a minute to to, to build that. And I think that's where that loss part was. And then the second, I think another really good point is you do, we need those people in our lives that are willing to be brutally honest with us and kick us in the ass when we need it. And Jeff, and Jeff, it's funny, Jeff Struker, he was in the Ranger Regiment with me and in that same battle. And Jeff became a pastor down the line. So when he called me, he was, you know, he's, he's like, He's like Chaplain Struger, and he's telling me, dude, you need to, I don't know anybody that can do what you can do. And whether you like it or not, you need, this is your story to own. And if you don't tell our story, who's gonna, and you're like, oh God, and Jeff was right. And it took a minute, it, it took a minute, but I think once I put my, I committed like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And I went up there to Nashville and I lived on credit cards for a while, but I gave it a hundred percent and it worked. You know, I, I think that's uh, the, the, that transition though part. I hadn't really thought about that, John, until you said it, that, um, cause I see it a ton out there in the world right now. There's a, we have so many over the last 20 years, you got Iraq and Afghanistan, you got everybody transitioning now from a peace t- to a peacetime military. So everybody's getting out and they're having to find their way in the job market. And they're coming out and it's it feels odd because they feel a little bit discombobulated and lost because they don't have that sense of purpose yet. So it's uh, – and that's one of the things that that I preach from a stage is – you have to go out there and find it, right? You yeah. you were fortunate. You had a passion, and you took that chance and you followed it. And it and it it ends. You know, God takes care of your dreams if you if you if you if you honor them. If you honor your dreams and keep and give them a hundred percent, they'll they'll come through. You know, some version of it. It won't be exactly what you think, but it will work out. So one of the things that I, I'm always telling the veterans that I meet at all these events is. You got to give that, that transition is tough, uh, but the burden of a, of reassimilating back into society is on you. So if you find yourself out there getting pissed off and angry, like, well, they don't get it. And the real world isn't like, you might want to take a look in the mirror because you, the, you're 1%. 
1% of the public at any time in America serves in the military. 99% don't. There's 6% are veterans, so some of them are going to get it. But 99% of the people don't get it, and they're not going to. And it doesn't make them any less. It just means you have to learn to speak their language, and you have to learn to go. And so what I tell them is just go in there and do what you know how to do. Set the example. Mm-hmm. Show them that this is – I'm here to uh, take care of people. I'm here to take my skill set and be a part of something. And sooner or later, they'll take notice, and they'll they'll see – what you're about. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and I think most people have a good BS indicator. Like when, when you sit down with someone and you're just like talking out your rear end about something that you know nothing about, most people after a little bit of time would be like, does this, this guy don't even actually know what he's talking that's, about. He's totally making this shit up. Los Angeles. That's LA right there. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so, uh, you know, it, it, like you said, like if, if you're, if you're just honest, if you're straightforward, if you accountability is something that I feel is, is kind of lacking a lot in today's society. And that's something I try and teach my, you know, I've got a 15 year old daughter back in Vegas that's living with her mom. And it's just like a constant battle to just say like, look, I don't care that you screw up. I do care when you don't admit that you made the mistake and you don't try and correct it. Like that's, that right. to me is way worse than the actual act of making a mistake. No one's perfect. We all make mistakes. And I still am making mistakes. Like, don't don't think that I have... I, I went from not being a parent to being a parent. And it's not like I, I had a, a instruction manual on how to handle raising a kid. Because the problem is, once you figure out how to deal with your kid at five years old, next thing you know, they're eight. And it's a whole new set of problems. And then once you get eight years old figured out, now they're a teenager and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, so it's like a constant learning thing. It's funny. There was a quote that um, I was told a very long time ago. It was that by the time you are old enough to realize your parents were right, you have a kid telling you that you're wrong. Yeah. That's a a song lyric right there and a good one. That's a, that's great. uh, So, so it's just, it's just funny. But uh, now real quick before we get too far into it, because uh, like I said, I I did listen to the audio book and I absolutely loved it. Like I basically um, turned it on every morning when I would go downstairs and I was working out or at the time I was down in the garage working on building some holsters and stuff like that. And like, it was just playing. And, and I just listened to the I, I think I listened to the entire thing in two days. Um, so where can people go to not only, either find their book if they're, you know, if they're the person mm. that likes to sit down in a nice quiet room and read, which is weird to me, but or to find the audio book, where can people get that information? Because I do think that 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 you're, the way you tell the story and and the lessons that you teach throughout that story, I think, are, are something that anyone could could really benefit from. So, yeah, well, thanks. I, I think when I wrote it at the time, if I, if I look back on it now, I always go, oh, man, there's so much more I could have added. But it was where I was at at the time. And if I was there, someone else has been there or is there. And sort of like with you, when you said, you, you know, this is I like doing this podcast. I'm doing this stuff. This is stuff I like to talk about. And if I like to talk about it, there's others that like to talk about it. It's, you know, we're all, there's only so many different human aspects. Like <laughs> there's going to be some similarities between us. And I, I always send people to my website only because I get that last album I did in Nashville was called Give It Away because I realized pretty after a while, like the digital world, by the time someone goes and buys something on audiobooks or or iTunes or anything like that, the it comes back to you who wrote it and spent the time doing it. You get like six cents off of it, you know. And I was like, this is silly. They would send you pages of royalty statements, and you're like, wow, this is great. You look into it, and you get to the box at thirty three dollars. This is great. you know because <laughs> it's creative accounting out there. I don't know how it all works, but. So I just I call I created this idea just give it away and um, so I would say just go to the website because there's there, you can download everything there for uh, anything that we've done that that I have that I have ownership on uh, we we um, we just give it to you so there's a link on our website where you can just click it and I think it'll just download for you and the website real it's quick not, if it's screwed up let me know I'll I'll uh, I'll go back and get it fixed but. That's what. That's where I send all the audiences that I'm speaking to. I said, you know, there's a link on our website if you want the audio book. Go get it. And what's the website, real quick? Just it, oh, Kenny just Thomas. my name, Kenny Thomas. Yep. Okay. Dot com. Perfect. Perfect. Now, um, you know, I think you you're in a very uh, 
interesting position like you said i mean obviously for those that listen to the audiobook they're going to get to hear your story and the way you talk because yeah i mean i feel like your book is more than just a leadership book like it's it's almost a book of of leadership but it's also a book about you know um how to prepare yourself not just for a mission but also for life because that obviously that's a very very big parallel right like you you train the way you fight, you fight the way you train and all that kind of yep. stuff, um, which is a life code kind of thing. Um, it talks about uh, working through adversity. So uh, it talks about courage. It talks about, I mean, there's just so much that your book actually covers. So I don't think it's just a leadership book. Like I said, like I, I listened to it and I got a lot of great stuff out of it yeah. just from listening to the story. And I'm like, you're talking to someone that my parents, when I was growing up, we used to, we had no TV in the house. Uh, so <coughs> we would listen to like the radio all the time and, uh, well, the radio gets boring after a while. So then you buy cassette tapes and like cassette tapes, my parents would buy me for entertainment were motivational speakers like Bob Moad and, and Zig Ziglar. So I used to listen to most oh, wow. motivational tapes for fun. Right. Yeah. Um, so even with all these years of listening to, to these motivational speakers and stuff, listening to your story, I still got something to to learn from it, you know, so, which is kind of proof that like, you're always, you always should be craving knowledge and always be learning. That's for sure. Yeah. Maybe so like we could have an hour long conversation on define leadership. Like it's, um, for me, they made it very clear. The Rangers, their motto was Rangers lead the way. And they never said that's a rank or a title or position. It's the example we set for the people we serve. So I embraced that definition of it. So who at any given time, who are you and I, serving who, who's right in front of us who's on our left and who's on our right a lot of times our family it's easy or you know it's easy for you to say well i got kelly i got my friends i got my family i got the folks at arms corps that i work with uh, but every now and then we get put with complete strangers that are right in front of us and if we remember what example am i setting who am i serving why have i been put here in this moment then that's for me, I kind of embrace that part of it as leadership too. And, and, um, so that makes me happy that the, the book is bigger than like your typical, um, well, okay, here's your pillars of leadership and here's a how to, it's not a how to at all. It's more of a, here's stories of people that set a great example, whether it's a biblical story, a battlefield story or a schoolroom story. Here's an example. Um, you should try and emulate that because you have that same ability. I, you know, dude, if you go to the, I, I've had a, because I do this now for a living, I've, I've had a chance to watch a lot of really great motivational speakers on stage. And what I find is whatever their story is, whatever it is, and they're always very different. The message is almost exactly the same. And it's like, we're telling people, you know what? Stop selling yourself short get out there, tell your story and use what you have to impact others in a positive manner. Basically you can do this because we're human, man. We're, and we're magnificent at selling ourselves short. That's, we're real. That's a skill set We all have, we're all, I, I still do it. You know, we're all good at it. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm just one guy and I can't do, yeah. You know, I, the more and more you say that, that I'm a just a, the more you begin to believe it and the more you believe it, then you start living it. And, you know, we see time and time again that people, the, the few people who step up during adversity are always the ones that believe they're part of something, mm-hmm. For whatever that may look like. You know, if I can do something about it, I'm going to, that might be, a, it might be combat. It might be a, a shooting demonstration. It might be a, a a mission trip that you went on in 11th grade with the church. Like I, whatever it is, you know, people who believe that they've got something to offer will step up and we're just not being told enough that you matter. Like, and if we, you know, if we went in, like I'm, I, I feel very disappointed in the leadership and I don't care what political party it is. I'm very disappointed that, it's they've gotten so maybe it's just because you and I have a better understanding of it now that we're a little older, but I, they spend so much time bickering and whining and complaining and they do very little to inspire people and motivate them and let them know, you know, we're part of something bigger than just ourselves. And th- they've done a whole lot of finger pointing and divisiveness. I, I, I don't. I don't necessarily think that that's great leadership. You know, if we, maybe they should listen to the book. 
No, well, you know what? Yeah, it's, that actually brings up a great point because that's what we talked about earlier. It's about accountability, and no political party seems to be saying, wanting to say, like, okay, you know what? We messed up, so we're yeah. gonna take. We're gonna take a. Let's learn from this lesson. Let's. No, it's always been like, well, okay, this didn't go the way it planned, but it's because so and so did this, and then well, they right. respond by saying, well, we wouldn't have done that if you didn't do this. Like, where's the accountability? Just admit you screwed up. You know, like right. that, like we said, like you're, it's almost that, that when you're talking to your kids, it's like, I, I will be upset that you drew all over the wall with a Sharpie, but I will be furious if when I ask you who did it, you tell me the dog did it. Like right. I get, I'm more pissed off that you lied to me than I am about the Sharpie on the wall. But it make it makes you think as a child, like, oh, daddy's really mad that I drew on Sharpie. No, it's, I'm, I'm mad that you lied to me. If you would have told me this... Yes, I drew on the wall. I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have. Or even if you just say, like, yeah, that was me. Like, don't don't you like it? Like, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> then let me explain to you why we don't do that in the future. You know, like, there, you know, so, yeah. I, accountability is something that is just, like I said, I, I feel yeah, is, is right. very it's, lacking. It's a, account, uh, if you go out there and you talk to whatever organization, what, let's just say it's a corporation or – uh, like an agricultural organization or education, wh- wh- whoever you're talking to and you ask them, what are some of your challenges? And they'll tell you, uh, they'll tell you accountability and responsibility. Mm-hmm. Like we, how do you teach people to be accountable to one another, take responsibility for their own actions? And well, and then I sit down, I go, that's, it's part of a culture you have to build. And it's, that you're then it starts with we're accountable to one another mm-hmm. and we there's a the trajectory that we're going on right now is people are people are so worried we're i always tell heidegger we're a nation waiting to be offended oh yeah if if we weren't if we were a little less worried about how, what we said that might offend people and a little more uh, thoughtful about, well, what are we saying that might inspire people instead? Like, why don't we have that dialogue? Mm. And, and so what ends up happening is you – when people don't know what to say, they say nothing. Generally speaking, be like, I don't know what to say, so I'm going to just not say anything. And then no communication at all doesn't doesn't – that leads to miscommunication and it comes it all that it comes back to start with responsibility taking action uh, and accountability to one another when you know okay i'm accountable for john and john's accountable to me like if i have a team of, of of people around me and we're all responsible for one another then it's not a bunch of me's and i's we're accountable to each other and so if john comes to me and says hey kenny dude i gotta tell you man um, the, the, I don't know what's going on, but you've been coming into work lately and your attitude kind of sucks. <laughs> like it's, it's dragging people down. So what's going on? What can we do to, uh, get you back on track so that we can count on you a hundred percent? Cause right now it's becoming a liability. You can have those types of conversations. If we have that culture where we know we're accountable to one another. You can't even come close to having that conversation if it's a if it, if we've been very divisive about everybody in the work. I, I I loved that we went to a place, John, where we celebrated a a ton of different differences within America. I loved it. I think it went a little. Then it's then it's just kept pushing a little too far, and then it became a divisive thing where people were like, well you have to validate me because I'm different. And then, and now I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be offended because you said the wrong thing. Well, I didn't mean to say the wrong thing. I just don't know any better. Why don't you teach me? Oh no, I'm not going to do that. I'd rather sit back here and point a finger at you. Mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating, but it does, it comes back because it's just like you said, it's like with our kids, we want to teach them that. Why could we not try doing that on a national level? where our leaders get out there and say, okay, you know what? We've been acting like a bunch of tools. Um, and let, let's, uh, let's try and let's try and bring this together. And I, I, I don't know if it can be done. I, I don't know if you can create that culture in a political environment, but 
I do know that if the people that are have been put in charge are not being the leaders we want them to be, then we have to be that for the people around us. And all we can affect is who have we been putting, you know, if you have the ability to do this, then then do this and have something to say that matters. Mm-hmm. Because if you and I wanted to watch our ratings shoot up, we could just sit there and, and throw out a bunch of BS, like, you know, and scream and point fingers and get people fired up and pissed. And then, oh, yeah, now you've got these little headlines that 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 people will because you're doing you're, but you're not really being part of a solution. You're just creating more problem. So, yes, be accountable, be responsible to one another. And that will lead to a more unified team, whoever your team may be. Yep. Yep. No. And, and you know what? It's, it's, you know, as far as the political side of it, my thought process on that is, um, you know, it, it scares me when someone wants to be the president because like who wants that job, who really wants to be the guy that makes the decision whether or not we go to war, whether or not we, we drop a bomb, like, man, I do not want that kind of responsibility. Right. So the person that wants that kind of responsibility or wants that job, that, that kind of power is exactly the person that probably shouldn't have it. And then it's even worse when it's backed by all the money that is included in politics, that I think is the worst. I mean, you can't tell me. I mean, you know, the, the big joke is always about like, if you want, if you want to be good in investment, forget Warren Buffett, follow Nancy Pelosi, because she'll show you when to sell and when to buy. Because how how do you make you know her her annual salary, and yet somehow she's worth like millions and millions of dollars because of all of her <laughs> stock market purchases, right? With insider That's trading, funny. alleged yeah. insider trading, but. Um, you know, that that's the other big thing that, that is scary is the fact that you got this guy that's in the office that is claiming to be the leader of the free world. Um, and yet, you know, how much money that that family makes behind closed doors with backdoor dealing and stuff like that. Like that's that's what's scary, too, is is the fact that there's like there's so much secretive and, and, and sh- like the fact that people grow up saying like, I want to be a politician. It's like worrisome to me. Like really you, you, that's your job that you, as a kid, I didn't want to be a politician as I'll tell you what, as a kid, I wanted to be a trash truck driver. I thought it it was so cool to push. Yeah. I thought it'd be so cool to be riding on the back of the truck. Just, you're just cruising down the street, riding on the bumper. That's awesome. And then you pull the, pull the handle and make the garbage truck, eat all the trash. I thought that was so cool. That's what I, I, at no point in my life was ever like, Oh, you know, I'd really like to sit in the Senate and argue with people for four hours straight. No, it's a good business going into the trash world because there's (laughs) never a shortage of trash. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you know, I've talked to, I've got, I've got a handful of friends that are veterans and they ran for local office. And I asked them why they did that because it seems so daunting to me. Like my, my question, when you say who would want to do that for me, it's like, why would I want to put my family through that scrutinization where it really doesn't matter what you say, 55% 55% of the other side is going to think you're a dumbass. Like, mm-hmm. and they're going to be mad. They're going to come up with some reason. They're going to take, they're going to take everything, little snippets of what you said, and then they're not going to actually put them into context. And you're just like, but you know, that's not what I meant. And, 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 the, and my veteran friends that ran for office, it was because they saw such a lack of, fundamental leadership skill sets. And one of the things that we were really good at, whatever branch of military you served in, whenever you get a new rank, you go to a leadership school. They send you to a course and it's like a month or six weeks long. And they teach you these leadership skill sets as in more and more people that you basically become in charge of, they teach you bigger ideas at but it's fundamentally the same stuff all the way through, whether you took spent 30 years in the military or seven um, and, and my friends that ran for office, were like, I, I just was so upset that the people in leadership positions didn't really know how to lead. And it, and once they got the office, like I have a, one friend who's like, I got to be a mayor and another friend ran for governor, another ran, a guy ran for Senate. And it was basically because they were, they were just the people weren't setting an example and they're like, I, I know how to do that better. Mm-hmm. I only, it's had zero to do with 
um, I want to power and I want to manipulate how things work. They, they, they saw that there was an issue. And now that they've gotten into office, I asked them, well, what did you learn? And they said, it was good and bad, John. It was the good part was, you know, a lot of the people that are working at these local governments are good folks. Um, they just, they just don't know. They've not been taught. And so in order to make anything happen, there's because no, it's not a very efficient system at all. Like to make anything happen, you have to go in there and you gotta gradually educate them on how to lead by example and why we've got to do this program that benefits however it's gonna benefit. But that takes then you gotta go in there and establish all these relationships because people aren't gonna listen to you unless they know you care mm. about them. So you have to go in and he goes, and I asked my one friend who, he was like, it's leadership 101, man. You go back and you sit down with everybody and you kind of get to know them and you learn their names and you learn, you know, you learn your squad's names, you learn their family's members' names and you find out how they're doing, you check in on them. And he goes, and then sooner or later they know that you care. And then you, they said, it's ridiculously slow, which is why they said, you can't, I can't see how you could make anything happen in um in Washington DC at a presidential level because four years isn't enough time anymore like it's just I, you know maybe you go back and change the rules maybe they just say you're only allowed to be the president for one term and you get six years to do whatever you're gonna do and uh, and that's it and because I think so I don't I don't want to discourage the veterans out there who are trying to better their communities by running for some sort of office um, because it's I can't imagine that that would be just I, I I'm like why would you want to do that like because you're just it, half the people are going to like you half the people are going to not you know mm -hmm. so well, but so you, you, you make a very good point in the differentiations between a career politician and someone that says, you know what, you're not right. getting the job done and I know how to do it. So I'm going to run against you like that. That to me is duty, not a career. You know what I mean? Like great word. Great word. That's a word that you know, <laughs> duty, honor, commitment. What was it from uh, from a few good men? He goes, these are words we live by. These are words that you use as a punchline. Yeah. You know, like, uh, it's, it is. It's a duty. It's exactly right. That's a good way to put it. And that's and I think that's what a lot of people have forgotten about politics is that originally a career politician was not a thing. It was a duty to serve the people in your community, whether or not it was your colony, your your city, your state, and then eventually the country. Like it was a it was a duty that you brought upon yourself because you were a leader and you said, you know what, I know how to get us to that next level. And now it's turned into it's um I want to get to the next level. Not I know how to get us to the next level, but you know, like you said, yeah. it's, it's more about I instead of a team. So I don't know, man. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what what happens here. Um, That's a good point. That it's that I want to get if you and, and I not. Th this is me not bashing um, any president. I, I still have respect for the position, um, but I am. I look at the folks that have been running for, and I'm like that. Okay. I, I get, if we want a guy who's a business guy to get our finances back in order, that makes sense. Let's vote for a business guy. If we want, um, we want to do people kind of identify with what they believe. If, if, the, if that person has one or two things that they like that, that we think that we like, then maybe we'll vote for them. But what, where I was, um, when I look at the I and the me thing, and I, he, he wasn't like my favorite president, but if you look at President Bush, who had served in the military, if you look at his, his um, whenever he spoke and talked about what was going on, it was always a we, mm -hmm. and th when it was a they, like the folks in the military are doing this and this, and they're, they're outstanding, and I'm... I'm I'm honored to be with them, and if he he was a I've got fr I have a friend who flew Air Force One, and he tells stories about President Bush and and how he was such a great 
soldier's president. Like he really cared about the troops and would sit down and take time and, 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 and hang around and talk to him and bullshit with him. And then compare that to the next when President Obama came in and President Obama was a fantastic speaker with these great um, – with these great ideas and, and he was the first black president and we were excited that we, we we'd finally done that as a nation. Uh, and then, but if you go back and listen to most of his stuff militarily, his was always a, and then I gave the order and I did this because he just didn't come from that headspace. He grew up in politics. Yep. He didn't grow up in the headspace of, of a military and it's a thing we've got to do. It, it, that there's a, that it's bigger than I'm part of something bigger. Mm. Um, unless it was in some of the, the very eloquent speeches he said, but when you really listen to what he had to say, it was about I and me. And then, uh, of course, <laughs> you know, we all, president Trump was all me. It was all <laughs> me. I'm, you know, I'm fantastic. And, uh, and I just, you're right. I, I would love to see it. I would love to see it move to um, a more of a servant position to what it used to be. And then maybe we could have some of the more really squared away big thinkers and people who, who aren't career, yep. you know, uh, that will step up and help help really good servant leaders and that will lead the nation. I think that there's probably some good ones up there um, on the Hill. I think if you walk in and out of those the, the, the congressmen and congresswomen offices and sit down and talk to them, if they have a second to breathe, uh, I think you'll find some good ones. But as an entity, the system is, is kind of jacked up. Yeah, as far absolutely. As producing good leaders. Yeah, for sure. And and you know, it's also for me, you know, my my aspect of it or my uh, my take on it is like, man, it's it's hard when when you grow up the way some of these politicians have. Man, they've been out of touch with the general population community for as long as they've been alive because they've always had armed security, a gated community. Like, yeah, of course they think life's great because they've never had to. Be it's like it's like being an actor. I remember uh, I was on a set for the We Were Soldiers movie, and it would be like Mel Gibson would go, "Man, I sure am thirsty," and then a bottle of water. There, like I don't. I'm like, "Hey, Mel, did you have you? Do you even know where the grocery store is, dude?" He goes, "Yeah, it's right there, Craft Services." I'm like, "Uh huh." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, like. Uh, it's it's their own reality. Yeah, it's like, oh, what are you talking about? Life's great. It, it must be great to be an American right now. It's like, man, when was the last time you just took a stroll around your city without safety glass and armed escorts and stuff? Because you'll get a completely different understanding of, of how your city is deteriorated or how the people feel so dejected and let down by their governments. Yeah. Not just the federal, but the local and state. I mean, you know, a lot of people just yeah. feel like they're left out and stuff. But I don't know. It's like I said, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how how things come around. Now let's uh let's let's move on to a happier subject here. Uh, not that I I don't mind talking about politics, but there is something that uh, since you talked about being in the in the movie We Were Soldiers, there was another movie that you were in. That has a great scene of you. You're actually doing your, you're, you're performing the talent that you're known for. And, and what I needed to know is do, uh, do Josh Lucas's eyes really sparkle the way they do that they did in the movie Sweet Home Alabama? In oh, yeah, even more. Uh, my, my, I have a hot wife, but you know, I would have left her for him. <laughs> <laughs> so so explain how i mean how does something like that come about was that something where you pitched an idea to sweet home alabama being like oh yeah if you need a band like or did they did they just like reach out to you to to be the, oh god like no. how, how did so I mean, you gotta that's that's a great it that is a great lesson and whenever i've been given a, an opportunity to speak I, I, i'm I, i'm on the board of the kent state university up here in ohio and i'll go down there and talk to the the music industry, uh, engineer kids. And, and they're like, I said, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of time, but here's my advice to you. Don't suck. <laughs> um, cause your day is going to come. 
the doors, like people ask, what was your big break in music? I'm like, well, there wasn't one big break. It's a whole bunch of doors have to open that you have to just keep going through. And even, because I used to think, if we could just get that record deal, man, if I could just get the record deal, we're going to, we've made it. But then you realize you get the record deal and you're still in line. You got four people in front of you. You know, it's a, you know, Mark Wills has got to put his single out and Kelly Pickler's got to put her single out. And so you're in, we had to wait in line because because the team around you, you're as good as your weakest link. And if your weak link is the radio promotion team or Phil, who's the new guy on the radio promotion, like that's going to be that's as good as you'll be. Mm. And the way that Sweet Home Alabama happened was the – it's that same story. The door opened up, but we didn't suck. So it turned – so my 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 girlfriend at the time was in the band. So I, we had a very skinnerty sound to begin with. So we had like the three background girls singing in the background. And she was working on the – she worked on the set for Sweet Home Alabama. Mm. And they they were all looking for something to do that night. This, they were all up. The headquarters for the movie was in Atlanta. She said, you know, my band's playing here in Atlanta tonight. And they go, you're in a band? Oh, yeah. This is, band's called Cornbread. You should come out. Okay, let's all go out. Turns out the director of the movie was in town that week. They all went out to this club that we're playing, and we didn't suck. Like, we had a great time. They had fun. And like... And then they're like, man, we should put, we should find a place for you in the film. And Andy, who was the director, goes... Well, there is the scene. There's the bar scene and the festival scene. We could make a thing for you, and if you guys want to do it. And I'm like, hang on, let me just check my calendar, Andy, real quick. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, right. <laughs> I still get checks from that movie. <laughs> and that was what 20 something years ago. I still get a check from that movie. It, who knew Reese Witherspoon would have that kind of shelf life? That was awesome. Uh, you know, I got to admit that is a guilty pleasure of mine. I absolutely love that movie. I think it's fantastic. Um, and then yeah, when Kelly pointed out, he's like, "Yeah, you know, that's 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 Kenny there." I was like, "Oh my gosh, this interview just got so much better now." <laughs> so now, uh, interesting yeah. there. Uh, can you explain to people? So, so your band name was Cornbread, and your nickname is Cornbread, if I'm correct. Yeah, that was a, it was my nickname. It kind of a so when we were all sitting, the band was me, and then a bunch of local guys in Columbus, Georgia. So, uh, so you had this odd mix of like the guys from my platoon would come out to see us play, and then the local guys had all their friends and a bunch of girls. So that was a really great mix. So it just kept building and building. And uh, one day we were like, we we're like, what are we going to name the band? So we all just threw something in the hat, and um, and they were gonna, whatever we pick out is what we're going. With. Oh. And we came up and formed it. And so, <laughs> Because, you know, you're not going to get five other guys to agree on, oh, yeah, that's Kenny's nickname. Let's go with it. <laughs> right, right. So You're going to make fate, fate make this happen. Now, uh, it, it, it worked out. Your, your nickname of being named Cornbread, which is, uh, for those that um, listen to the audio book, you'll, you'll hear exactly why his nickname becomes Cornbread. Uh, so I hope everyone understands that. But for those that don't, uh, tell them real quick, how did you get the nickname? Of course, cause I, I know if like from when you're, when you're among your friends, you don't get to pick your nickname, your friends pick your nickname yeah. for you for something. So, so the story behind my nickname that yeah. I got in high school was that, you know, I'm half Asian and half Irish. So, um, I, I ended up having just a bunch of white friends and we were at one of my buddy's house, um, hanging out one day after school and his mom came home, uh, came upstairs to ask him to do something. And she didn't realize that the rest of us were in, in, in the house. So when she when she opens the door and she's like, hey, Eric, could you? Oh, oh, my gosh. I didn't know you guys were all here. Um, you know, if you guys are hungry. And then she looks directly at me and she goes, we have some egg rolls in the freezer and you can heat them up. <laughs> and from that point on, my nickname became egg roll. So everything associated with me was egg roll. And again, I didn't get to pick that name, but the moment and my friends decided from now on, you, you shall be known egg roll. So you got the nickname of cornbread. So how, how do your friends pick yeah, cornbread yeah. as your nickname? Well, one, that's an awesome story too. I'm so sorry that you had someone who just I guarantee there was zero maliciousness behind that. I was just someone who's completely ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I did make I did make her make them for me. I was like, you know what? Yeah. Yes, that those sound delicious. I would love to have some egg rolls right now. So, 
This is so wrong on so many levels, but it's so funny. That but that, see, if, then, if you if that, she made that comment today, though, oh my gosh, I could rip her alive yeah. all over TikTok. Being like, I, so I was just it's like, yes, no, yes. I actually laughed about it. I giggled, and it was my nickname. It, it's still like to this day, I'll still even say like, oh yeah, you know, my, if you want to call me a girl, that's fine too, because that's what I was called. That's why I was known all in high school, but. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you were in the squadron, that's what, you know, you would get, you don't get to pick your net nickname. Remember, what was it? What was it? it was uh, Animal House. He goes, and your name will be Flounder. <laughs> Why? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Cornbread was, um, they, uh, they had this terrible, it was this frozen pan of defrost and serve. And I, I kind of liked it. And when we were out in the, we were out on deployment. You know, I didn't eat. I, 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 I was in college. I was a vegetarian. I, I ate fish, and the only thing you could ever get fish wise was like an MRE that was tuna and noodles. And so whenever it was like steak night or roast beef night, everybody came running to me because they knew I was going to give it to somebody. And but they always felt like they should hand me something, so they would give me the cornbread. So I would sit there with it. One day I had this tray, and it was like eight pieces of it, and so. We were on the radio that night, and I was calling in something, and the guy that was on the other end was some, a friend of mine, and he goes, hey, Cornbread, is that you? <laughs> so that, and that stuff. That's, yeah, exactly, right? Once, once, once it hits, you're like, well, okay. Doesn't make any sense. But there, yeah. yeah, it's like, all right, well, I guess we're in this room now, so we'll just go ahead and close yeah. this door and keep moving on, like you said. So, oh, man. All right, now, so... Um, it, you obviously went through something pretty uh, intense, interesting as far as the Battle of Mogadishu goes, uh, and you survived, like you said. And, and so you, you go around, and you tell the story and stuff like that. Now, what is your relationship with firearms since you've gotten out of the military? Do you still actively go out shooting, training, and stuff like that? Or well, I, I see what you did there, John. That was good. That was that was called a transition. It was very good. <laughs> we brought it right back to to um, our hap, our good sponsors. Uh, so it's still a skill set that I have, uh, shoot, move and communicate. It never left me. And especially at the level that we were at. And so throughout, I found on the stage, I was really good at telling people, Hey, you really should start working on your leadership skill set and trying to motivate them to be better examples. But I didn't, I had, I gave them zero on a how to, I just, until one day I decided, all right, you know, if I could put together sort of a mini ranger school course that American, corporate America, business America, people could come through, they could sort of see for themselves. And I, I was like, we'll see how that goes. So we kind of, we, we designed this thing and it was originally going to be sort of this, okay, we'll bring police forces, we'll bring military groups in because the military units are always looking for someplace else to train. Um, and I'm sure we'll get some business folks, uh, who, who kind of want to touch the shiny object and, and be next to, Hey, you get to operate next to them. And we did the very first one. It was called downrange. We called it downrange leadership course. We did it out in Wyoming. And I just called a bunch of friends and I, you know, you get to know some interesting friends over the years. I had an astronaut. I had an Olympian. I had pilots. I had school teachers. Um, I just had some really super cool thinkers and achievers that not all of them were completely physical anymore. Like the, the astronaut was 63. He was our oldest. Mm. And we had Delta Force guys and Rangers teaching the course. And we, we designed it to be just like a ranger school mission. So we shoot, move, and communicate. It wasn't a shooting course. So I, I wanted to be very clear with everybody on that. But we do teach you to shoot. And we would start in the morning with handguns. And we, well, we started with rifles because rifles are easier, mm -hmm. right? That's the principle of marksmanship. So we would teach them how to get a nice shot group. I don't care if you hit the center of the target. I just want to see you make give me a shot group. So then now you're consistent. Right. And once we got to that, we could adjust them. Um, and it was always fun to do. It was always fun, John. Like, I, I know you've been that moment. Like, you kind of live where the guy goes, hey, Kenny. I go, man, I don't, I don't, I, I'm getting my shot group right, but 
I don't think this thing zeroed correctly because it just keeps, I keep hitting it. I'll go, here, let me see it real quick. Hang on. Pretty sure it's zeroed. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Gotta love it. <laughs> and it's, and what, what the course ended up doing was it took people out of their, so it, it, basically it all culminates three days of training in a mission based scenario. So then in the end you run a mission and we switched over to blanks. So we went blanks and then a lot of flashbangs and just to create chaos and, and for the mission. But what you ended up doing was you took people out of their comfort zones. Because even if you had a shooter come through, like you're a competition shooter it's, and you're a great shooter, it's a different skill set than what we're doing. And even if you do, even if you do have a, great, a good person who's comfortable with firearms, they may be good, but they're not as good as us in the, in the environment that we're doing. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. Right. So, and we teach them things. And so everybody was out of their comfort zone. And what I always loved as the, as the years, as the course evolved and you would see, um, the ladies, like we had a, we had a pharmaceutical company come through that it was the regional managers for Botox. Now, come on, tell me that's not your, that's your stereotypical <laughs> tactical student. It's not. <laughs> I know. But by the end of it, they were putting, round center mass they were confident and they were leading like hey it's your turn to lead um debbie and debbie would take over and and move people through the woods and assault a target and it was so what we found was it was more, it was less an experiential course and be turned into this team building thing and so companies started sending their management and folks to it so we still we still operate. Um, it's tough to find a place that is is totally good with ammo and rifles and and piss handguns. And so we wanted to talk rifle. What we started doing was we transitioned over um, to take a little bit of the risk factor out of it. We we transition transitioned over to the airsoft where we can drop in a pistol into the, you know, a rifle look. So we can teach both and we can teach the principles of marksmanship with basically plastic pellets. And then on the last day, we'll take them to the range and we'll give them rounds on, and a, with a, with real ammo and real rifles. And okay. Now we want you to do, we're going to show you that what we taught you, the principles are still the same. And it's so much fun when you see them get to fire off and you hear the metal clank down range and they look back up at you and they're smiling, you know, and because that first BAM takes them by surprise yep. uh, if they're not used to it. And but it's a we I still use I'm I'm still very proficient and um, I, but I my ex, my use for weapons now is a teaching environment on how to be part of something, you know, muzzle awareness, you're moving through the woods. Uh, and then, and I remember one time, my, my best, my favorite story was, I still, BJ Miller was an Olympian and she was this super awesome, motivated hippie chick. And she comes through the course because I asked her and she's like, I don't know, Kenny, man, you're going to have guns and stuff. I'm like, well, this is a rifle and this is a pistol. Well, you know, this is my gun. If you had here, you want to meet me? Yeah, I yeah, know. So, so we, she gets there that day and we transition from the zeroing targets that are just circle targets and we transition to silhouettes. And she goes, oh, and she looks over at Tom, who's, who was the, the Delta Force commander. And she goes, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this shooting at a target. It looks like he, like it's sort of human shape. And Tom goes, hang on, let me fix that for you. And Tom goes over to the box and he pulls out this poster, basically of Al and his buddy Kaida with rocket launchers aimed right at you. And he goes, okay, this guy and this guy are shooting at you and your kids. And, and BJ goes, <laughs> goom, 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 puts it right in there. I'm like, and there you go. With proper motivation, it'll all follow. <laughs> so, it was that was my favorite story about people who um, 
like I think she got it. Like she's never, you know, she's not she's not pro, she's not anti. She just was like, okay, I get it now. Well, and, and yeah, I think you know when when we talk about firearms, and, and it's one of the things that uh, I think is great. Um, from from my standpoint, so I, so I would agree with you in, in one thing uh, that you said, which is that um, look, I, I am I, I consider myself like one of the world's most okay shooters. Okay, I'm not. I haven't won nationals yet, but I've been on the podium at nationals before. I've been a top ten comp- contender, right? So I, I, I'm pretty decent at what I do. Um, but also, I understand that what I do is a choreography. It's a choreographed dance. Like when I go to a competition, I literally get to walk the stage a day before the match starts to say, "Here's where all the targets are. Here's going to be my my plan of attack when I execute this stage. I'm gonna I'm gonna reload mm-hmm. from this port to this port. I'm gonna you know run run the course this way." So when the buzzer goes off, the only noise that I'm really hearing is the voice in my head, and then the sound of the gun going off and hopefully the steel when I'm hitting it and all that kind of stuff. But again, it's still a choreographed dance that I'm performing. And, you know, I I've done some training with some SWAT officers and some law enforcement departments. And I, I've made it very clear with them that when, when we start our training is like, all right, guys, I'm, I'm going to explain something. I play a game. I'm going to show you the skills that I have to use to play the game. Well, take what you want and leave the rest at the door. So if if you learn one yeah. thing, then great. I'm I'm glad that you've found something that you can incorporate into your training of the tactical world or, you know, blah, blah, blah. but just understand that, you know, I, I know that I'm playing a game. And like you said, like if you if you were to throw me in a situation where I've got it like um you know, everyone thinks that Call of Duty makes you a good like soldier in a way like if you can go online and play in the multiplayer levels and you're uh, it's like man that's that's great when you're looking through a screen that only shows you this much of the world but the fact of the matter is you you throw yourself in the middle of a warehouse and you say oh by the way there's four other people in here that all have guns and they're looking for you boy it's a little bit more different when you're you're being hunted and and stuff it's completely different mindset completely different level of stress you know, stuff like that. So I definitely don't think that I, I well, even more so is when um when you're accountable and responsible for the four other lives yeah. that are with you on your team. That's a whole different like most of us will will jump in front of a bus for our kids, um, and we would have we don't even think about ourselves on the battlefield. It was always you're just worried about oh man. John's hit or I can't let that happen to him. And that's what it becomes about. Like I I don't care how far back you go into the history of the of the fighting soldier. And I take I mean even in the US if you took like take Gettysburg for let's see, Gettysburg. If you ask those guys on both sides of the line, you know, why are you fighting? No one's going to tell you I'm fighting for states' rights or I'm fighting to preserve a union or I'm fighting against the atrocities of the institution of slavery. No one in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge will tell you they were fighting against Hitler and his atrocities against the Jewish people. No one in my dad's generation will tell you it's, well, what are you up here fighting for, sir? Well, I'm fighting for this against the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. And none of us will tell you that we are fighting against Al Qaeda, ISIS, Taliban, or the spread of global terrorism. No one. The only thing you're fighting for is each other. And that's when the stakes become, it's, it's not a game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a different, it's a different, it's a different, different scenario. And, but I, you know, most people, I would encourage you, though, John, if you do get yourself, next time you find yourself in front of a, um, a tactical group or a SWAT team and you're there to help be part of an instruction, uh, be careful about leading off with what, remember, we're, we're human and we're magnificent at selling ourselves short. So be careful about leading off with, hey, just so you know, first thing, I, I just play a game. Like, they're looking at you like you're the expert. So go in there and tell them, you know, I, there's some things that I have learned in my career as a firearms and and here's some of the things that I can teach that will help you because I don't care how how you might not think that what you do relates to what they you shoot you put more rounds down range than they do. Yeah, that's they that's don't true. have the budget. They want the training. So don't go in there and sell yourself short on the front end. You can afterwards if if you if somebody is 
like, what's this guy doing? You know, he just plays a game. Well, then that guy's not in the headspace to be learning to begin with, and you were never going to reach yeah. that guy. So, you know, go in there and you're the expert, and they're looking at you like an expert. I had a so that I had my my publicist one time. I was standing on the Grand Ole Opry, and it was the it was the the um, the Ryman Golden the Opry. So there's two versions. There's the one out at Opryland, and then there's the Ryman, which is the old church, and it's like the historic Grand Ole Opry, and they only run that during certain months. And I got to play on that one one night. And the guy comes out, the host, and he sort of interviews me and talks, introduces me to the crowd a little bit. And I kind of sold myself short, like, I, you know, I don't really deserve, I don't know how I ended up here and all this. And my publicist, Claire, afterwards said, you know, Kenny, you got to stop doing that because the whole audience is looking at you wishing – wanting to know what's it like to be on that stage or there's people out there that are working their butts off um as musicians that's th that to them would be the definition of success and that and you're selling it short mm -hmm. you gotta stop doing that she goes if you can't think of something to say just say thank you and i'm like and that was the best advice i've been given of how to respond to those sort of things when i catch myself because you know it's all you, afterwards you're shaking hands and people come up and they'll they'll be like Man, I, I, I was one of the veterans in the audience raised his hand. Awesome. What'd you do? Well, I was in the Navy. And it always goes like this. I mean, I didn't do what you did. I'm like, stop <laughs> with that. Stop. You, sir, you raised your hand. Like, wait, you know, I, I wish that nobody had to do what I had got to, you know, what I was part of. But um, stop, stop being just a, is what I'm saying. So no, you don't. Check that next time you go in. You do make a very good point. And they're looking at you as the expert, so play the expert. No, play you know role. what? You're absolutely right. I will I will have to change that mindset. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Uh, absolutely. It, that does yeah. make sense. Um, now, so one of the things that I will find, though, and I, and I love this about uh, from what I've seen in, in the junior shooters that I've come across is – the level of confidence. So you talk about how the, the firearms training and, and the, the skill sets and the, the confidence that these people build going from, well, I've never shot a gun before to like, look, you're, you're hitting the middle of the target. You're executing the shots exactly the way you need to. And what I find with the junior shooters a lot is that, um, man, so I, I have rarely ever come across a junior shooter on the competition world that is cocky, obnoxious, lazy, like, they're normally very polite. They're very respectful. They go out, they work, they help reset the stage. They don't, you know, necessarily complain about it all the time. Like they do just as much work as we do. They'll train, they'll practice, and they respect the firearm. They respect all the safety rules. And that stuff I find translates over into the real world because, you know, you get done, you yeah. get done shooting a stage at a, at a big, big match. We, uh, the mo majority of us, you know, sometimes there's those people that are just a-holes in the moment or they're pissed off because they just had a bad stage and they just walk off. But normally you walk around and every RO that's working there, the range officers, you shake their hand and you say, thank you so much for being out here. We, I really appreciate you being here to help run the stage and get us through the match. Well, these kids go and thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Like, And that stuff translates. So it's not like they just do that on the range and then as soon as they go to school, it's like... Hey Timmy, can you hand these papers right. out? Hell no, bitch! Like you know, no, that doesn't happen. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like it, it translates, yes, and um, yeah. and so I think I think firearms really like it's not just about you know uh, self defense or just even you know practice. Like to me, there I think there's a lot to be said when you when you're able to trust your child uh, or anyone in that matter with a firearm because you know that they're proficient with it. They took the time and effort and energy to learn how to be proficient with it and how to be safe with it. And all. I mean, that, that's a responsibility. Like we said, we've, we've talked about how responsibility sometimes yeah. is, is something that's a necessity for, for us as human beings to be successful. And, um, you know, that, that's something cool. Well, you've created a, you've created a culture of the, it, that part of it. It's hard work and dedication and of precision and pro, but part of it is appreciation. And you've created that culture and that as goes the leadership, so goes the culture. And if you guys, the senior shooters are showing that, then of course the younger folks are going to follow suit with that because they want to be where you are and you've created that culture. It's funny that you use the word confidence. The, um, and and we'll start we'll start wrapping this one up. The um, the it was Patton, General Patton. He wasn't in Moby D. Shoot, different <laughs> dude. But um, uh, 
he said that the single most important trait in a great soldier was self-confidence. So how do you how do you give that to your people? You train them hard so that they know that whatever situation that they're in, they're going to be able to come out of it. So you you push them. And that's where that whole train as you fight, fight as you train comes from. Confidence in leadership, that leadership's making decisions on their behalf, look that has their back. Confidence in the equipment that you're using. It, we don't teach a kid to repel off of a wall because they need to learn how to repel off of a wall. We teach them it's confidence in the mm. equipment that you can trust this stuff. Confidence in the weapon system if, we, if you're using it correctly. Confidence uh, in each other that you're going to be there when you say you're going to be there, that you're accountable and you're responsible for me. And in confidence that you have that skill set to execute when the time comes. And it's, it's a... It's a huge thing. I, I, I teach uh, aviation now. I'm one of my jobs is a flight instructor, and the that part of it is not lost on me. Like the teaching people to be confident in the air traffic control system, because there's so much coming at them that they're not confident with. How do you communicate to air traffic control? How do you fly this very complicated aircraft? How do you push all the right buttons. And if I push the wrong button, I fly into the mountain, you know, how do I, and how am I confident so that when I take off, I'm going to get where I'm going safely, mm. you know, and it's confidence is the big word. And I think that's what that culture that you guys have created, um, does for folks. It builds. Yeah. Up. Well, no. And, and, you know, like uh, uh, I also did EMS for eight years out in Vegas and yeah, it was that, that idea of like the first time you experience a medical call of, of life threatening situation, your brain almost like seizes up. Like even though you've got, got the book smarts, the experience isn't there yet. So you might know what the book says, but to then actually perform and execute that skill set, which is so important to have a good field training officer um, when you're getting into EMS, because they're 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 not the guy that just pushes you to the side and says, yeah. "Okay, fine, you want get out of the way." You're you're in, my, but rather they they walk you through it, they talk you through it, they they remind you, they like tell you, like, so what what is it? You, tell me what you remember. From from class and the books and all, like and and you they they start to force you to regurgitate that information and then next thing you know the the yep. words remind you of the skill set that you had to practice and so you execute it and the next thing you know when you're off on your own you're able to think clearly because now you've got the experience of having someone to to explain and walk you through it um, that you're able to execute it by yourself and then eventually you become the you become the preceptor or FTO and you are bringing up the next generation of of EMTs or soldiers or anything like that now um yeah, there's no more uh, real world training than being in, in, in the EMS world. <laughs> it, it doesn't get yeah, more exactly. Than that. So, and then and then on top of that, and you take Vegas. You know, the, it's the things you probably saw if, were nuts. If you told yeah, me so. uh, before I started working that job that uh, in a year you're going to be chasing a naked dude high on meth. Um, with a bed sheet around Las Vegas Boulevard at two o'clock in the morning, I probably would have like laughed at your face and been like, you don't know what you're talking. You're high. You must be doing mushrooms. Well, sure enough, a year later, there I am chasing a naked dude that's high on meth with a bed sheet in my arms trying to catch him. And I'm just like, is this real life? I'm getting paid for this. Like, are you kidding me? So. Uh, yeah, this is, well, this is what I'm getting <laughs> yeah, paid right. I, I, uh, Most of the people I just end up on YouTube famous for this stuff, but I'm actually getting a paycheck. So. Right on. Well, I, you know, I, I like to end my episodes real quick with just a, a couple fast fire this or that kind of questions, and, and we'll just kind of wrap it up because I know you got you got some other things you got to take care of. Um, but um, well, it's called it's called dinner for uh, four. Year <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I got. They, they both just separately stuck their heads in here. And goes, Daddy, are you done podcasting? <laughs> I'm hungry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So we, we'll get these fast fire questions going, and then uh, we'll 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 wrap it up from there. So the first one I got for you is: Would you rather be fishing or would you rather be hunting? Depends on what I'm hunting. What What would you prefer to hunt? What's your preferred animal? <laughs> My, I've done enough for a number of hunting shows, and I don't. Every everybody always assumes that I've been hunting, and I always start laughing. I'm like, you know, never anything with four legs. <laughs> <laughs> got it got it so okay so well that's a different kind of hunting but we'll 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 let it count uh okay would would you rather be a ninja yeah. or a pirate i'm definitely a ninja and the reason being is there's out of the 10 things that a man should be able to do on my list of 10 things 
Uh, there's two that I can't do. One is weld and one is sail a boat. So I would not make a good pirate. <laughs> nice. Yeah. The sailing is a different. I, I, my dad loved sailing. I hated the, the idea of being an open ocean with Jaws. Um, and of course, when I was in high school, I was in the ROTC program for the Navy. And one of the things they made me do at Leadership Academy was sail, learn how to sail a boat. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm having to face my fear of open waters with a sailboat. But, um, it was, it was a fun experience. Yeah, it was a fun experience. But if you, if you were never like, Hey, so you want to go sailing? It'd be like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> so, uh, do you prefer the East coast or the West coast? If you had to visit one or the other. Uh, West Coast. Uh, Lewis and Clark were not wrong. (laughs) That's good reasoning. (laughs) Um, Okay. As a musician, do you prefer Fender or Gibson? Gibsons. Gibsons. Nice. Uh, Do you have a favorite Gibson? And and the reason being is they were the – back when they actually did sponsorships, they – hang on. Stay right there. We're about to see a bit of history right here. Well, this is my favorite guitar of all the ones I have. Oh. It's a badass rock star guitar, and it's a Gibson. There you go. Yep, that, that's a good reason to be a Gibson. And they man. took care of me. Good, good. I'm, I'm glad to see that. Yeah, that, that does look like a pretty badass guitar. I, actually, my favorite guitar that I have, that has got all sorts of character on it from my touring days as a Gibson Les Paul Studio. That's got like the belt buckle rubs on the back and like two of the knobs yeah. fell off. So like one of the knobs is a fender knob that I glued on. And another one's from like an Ibanez that my buddy had. So it's like a, it, it looks like a Franken guitar. You, gl- you glued a fender knob on. That's great. I, and I, I actually had to JB weld uh, the screws that hold my guitar strap in because I was in a hardcore band. So we thrashed on stage and I used to rip the screws out of the body every night. So I had to JB weld them into it. So like I said, that, that guitar has got some character. I don't even know if I could sell it if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and then last, qu- last question for you is, would you rather buy a classic car or rebuild one? Um, if I could move this studio, I'd show you the one that I rebuilt. You, 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 it's down in the garage. What'd you rebuild? It's a 1970s Super B. It started out as a grandma's coronet. And now it's a 446 pack beast. So that's what my daughter calls it. Daddy, are we going to school in the beast? I'm like, you know what, babe? I would love to take you to school in the beast, but something's always broke on it. That's <laughs> so. Yes. Part of the 10 things a man needs to be able to do is you, you got to be able to fix an engine when it breaks down on you. Uh, and that is a skill set that I learned by driving old cars. Oh, yeah. So I'm screwed. They're going to they're they're stop. They're going to break. And, they're, and you better know, have an idea what to do. Yeah, I know. If, if it's not the oil or the gas, then I'm kind of screwed with my knowledge. <laughs> so I said, but right on. Well, Kenny, thank you so much for taking the time to... Uh, Sit down and chat with me. I'm going to let you go so you can you can hang out with your family for the rest of the day. But uh, before we before we sign off, I'd like to give the last moment to you um, for you to be able to say thanks to anyone. If there's any organizations you want to uh, you know bring shed yeah. some light on, then then now's your time. So go for it. Thank you. Um, and just in case there happens to be a veteran that kind of identified with the front end of our conversation, where that transition challenge or you're you're facing some challenges like maybe you went to the VA and the VA didn't you talked to the wrong person and they were a tool or whatever and you're just not getting the results that you want I, I I'm on the board of a group at work called Povat so it's project one vet at a time and we're we're looking at folks who are having challenges facing uh, getting through the VA system and there's not bad people at the VA. It's just a system, and you and you need to. There's a v- very uh, specific protocol to get your benefits taken care of. Or if you're just like me and you felt like, wow, well, you know, give it to someone else. Like I don't, I'm okay. I don't need my VA benefits. That's not how the program works. If we don't use it, we lose it. So uh, if you're having a challenge with that, get in touch with us. It's P-O-V-A-T, POVAT, one project, one vet at a time. And uh, we can, we can ha- or if you've got a family member that is struggling to get those benefits um, filled out and pushed through, talk to us and we can, we can guide you through it. I've seen some lives change. So that's why I stuck with these folks. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, 
every organization out there is a good organization and does some really cool things for the veteran communicate uh, veteran population. This just happens to be one of the ones I work with. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, man. Thanks. Well, Thanks no, that. absolutely. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, um, uh, sharing your story. Like I said, I mean, I, your audiobook was, was awesome to listen to. I, I definitely picked up a lot from it and, and I hope, uh, this conversation will encourage others to give it a try. Cause I mean, it's, yeah, there's nothing but good that could come from listening to it. Um, and then, and then the way you you talk and like your mannerisms and the way you yeah you I mean it just seems like you knew the people you were working with and how they talked and how they acted and their minds because I mean it was just I mean there were several oh, yeah. times I laughed out loud because of something you said someone else was saying or whatever but uh, absolutely great fantastic so guys make sure you check that out kennythomas dot com uh, get that book uh, you can you can also find his music videos like I said. Just be forewarned. If you go to look at his music videos on YouTube, you're going to see that he had way more hair back in the day than he does now. But uh, awesome songs. And, uh, man, it was just it was awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for for chatting with me. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, buddy. Thanks, John. To, uh, to give Kelly a hug. To thank you for, for hooking us up, man. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Absolutely. With that being said, thank you guys so much. Make sure you uh, make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that kind of fun stuff. And until next episode, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you later.